in the weeks leading up to the Winter Olympics, 1994, way back when, uh, her, she was everywhere in American media because she had become America's sweetheart. And, and let me remind you or tell you why. Uh, when Nancy was backstage at the American skating finals, the competition they were having to see who would represent the United States in the Olympics, but when she was backstage there, she was attacked and injured so that she could not compete in, in that competition. And so there was an investigation that went into figuring out what was going on there. And it, it was found out that, that the crime, she, she was attacked by the then husband of her main rival, Tanya Harding. So scandal, you know, he did it to take out the competition. And so the scandal went on for, for weeks, right? And so the Olympic, the U.S. Olympic Committee finally decided that Nancy Kerrigan, even though she hadn't been able to compete in that competition, she would go represent us in the Olympics. So they thought, they thought she had the best chance of doing well there. But they also sent the winner of that competition, who was the evil Tanya Harding, right? So they go to the Olympics. And so the stage is set, right? International stage uh, for this showdown between all oh, the sweet, innocent Nancy Kerrigan and the evil Tanya Harding, oh, and all those other skaters from all the other countries right then. We didn't really care about any of them. And, and so the competition gets underway. And Tanya Harding, she kind of gave a lackluster performance, if you remember. Uh, there was some drama around that, even as she was doing that. But then Nancy Kerrigan, she went and she just shined. And she brought home the Olympic silver medal for the United States. And so, like, yeah, we were like all for it, right? We love Nancy Kerrigan. Oh, poor Nancy. She fought hard and, and she got her medal. And we loved Nancy Kerrigan. Until the next scandal came along. And we forgot all about Nancy Kerrigan. Who here, until I mentioned her name, had thought about Nancy Kerrigan in years? Who don't know anything about her, her life now, right? Uh, I mean, from Olympic medalist to, well, well, who cares, right? That, that was her glory. She had glory, but it was fleeting. Glory so often is fleeting. As quickly as it comes, crowd, crowds change their minds, and the glory is gone. And maybe you can identify with that because maybe in your life you've experienced how quickly glory fades. And let's be honest, glory is kind of maybe too big a word for us in our humble lives. So maybe not glory, but at least favor, the favor of other people. We've, many of us have experienced what it's like to enjoy the favor of others, the glory of others, just to have it all go away. We fall out of favor. And it might be whether that's a feeling you feel your family has forgotten you or left you, or maybe, you know, it's a work situation where you were at work and you were out front and you were leading something and everyone was behind you until it wasn't very successful. And then all that, those people behind you are no longer behind you. Or maybe it's just, hey, you're part of a circle of friends, but you find you're no longer part of a circle of friends. You've fallen out of favor and you don't know why. See, glory or favor is fleeting. So many of us have been through a situation where we discover that personally. Crowds change their minds very quickly. So maybe that helps us to understand a little bit about what Jesus experienced the final days leading up to his death on this earth. I mean, because let's face it, the Sunday before he dies, Jesus enters into Jerusalem into a parade of glory, right? It's a parade of glory, and it's a familiar story to many of us. We celebrate it every year, the week before Easter. It's Palm Sunday. And what's going on? Jesus, he's been making his way from Jericho to Jerusalem, where he's going to, he's going to Jerusalem to celebrate the, the Passover festival. The Passover festival was a huge religious festival, a huge religious holiday among the Jewish people. When they celebrated how uh, centuries earlier, God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And so Jews, by uh, by this point in time, by the time Jesus was here, they'd been scattered all over the known world. And they came from all over the known world. They returned to Jerusalem to celebrate this great holiday. And so Jesus, he's going to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday. And he's uh, probably with a crowd of people. Because like I said, there were crowds of people coming from all over the world. But also, it was safer to travel in crowds back then. You know, safer along the road. So he's probably with at least a small crowd of people. And he's probably walked most of the way. Because, hey, they don't have all these wonderful transportation devices that we have back then. They either rode something or they walked. And most people walked. So Jesus probably walked most of the way. But as they come into this final stretch to Jerusalem, Jesus sends two of his disciples into a town. He says, hey, there'll be a donkey there in her, her, her colt. Just bring them to me. And the disciples, they go. And they get the donkey and the colt. And they bring them to Jesus. And the disciples put their cloaks over them. And then Jesus rides them into Jerusalem. And in riding into Jerusalem in this fashion, Jesus is actually making a statement. He's making a declaration. It's subtle. 
but it's clear. He is declaring, I am the Messiah. I am the anointed one from God that was promised to you long ago who would come and save the people. Because in riding the donkeys into Jerusalem like this, Jesus is intentionally fulfilling a prophecy given in Zechariah chapter 9 in the Old Testament scriptures. And the people would have known this prophecy and they would have recognized when it was being fulfilled and they see it. So those in the crowd traveling with Jesus, they apparently get the message. They understand what he's saying, and they get all excited. And they start running ahead of Jesus, and they're running behind Jesus, and they're all excited. They're running everywhere, and they're cutting branches off trees. And the other Gospels tell us they're palm branches, hence the name Palm Sunday. And they're cutting, and what are they doing? They're cutting these branches off, and they're putting them down on the road in front of Jesus. All stuff you would do for the coming of a king. And as they do this, they are shouting, they are shouting, Hosanna, which means save us, save us now. And these people are acting, they're most likely thinking, hey, this is Jesus. He's our king, and he's riding into Jerusalem to begin his rule, his reign. And he's going to overthrow our Roman oppressors, our Roman rulers. And that's what they all want. So they're excited. They welcome him in style. It's like red carpet treatment here that they're giving. It's like rolling out the red carpet. And I thought about this this week. I thought, hey, if E and Access Hollywood existed back then, you know, you know their annoying uh, 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 interviewers would be there on the red carpet wanting a quote, a soundbite from Jesus before he entered in, into Jerusalem, right? And, and yeah, you're annoyed by that and so am I. So we're moving on from that. Uh, but it, it's, it's exciting thing thing and suddenly it's like like this parade and it's like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade that, and Jesus is the center of attention. Now, now for those of you who, who, who's watched the Macy's Parade before, most of us have seen it. Have you ever seen Have you ever watched it with kids? You've watched it with kids? What's the most exciting part of that parade for kids? Santa comes through. You wait to the very end for Santa to come through, right? And it's an exciting thing. And Santa comes out and he's happy and he's jolly and he's dancing all around, right? He's up there like this and putting a finger side of his nose. Seriously, my sister and I think Santa's drunk every year when we watch this. <laughs> But he's so happy and excited. And so all the people lying in the streets, they're cheering. They're excited. They're happy. They're thrilled. And Jesus coming into Jerusalem that day was more exciting than this. And so the, the crowd of people who had been traveling with Jesus, when he comes into Jerusalem, they're excited, and they meet up with all the other crowds coming into Jerusalem. And what happens when a group of excited people kind of meet other people? Sometimes that excitement spreads, right? And like it moves on, and it just gets bigger, right? So the small group of excited people becomes a bigger group of excited people. Case in point, I want you to, everyone grab your palms. It's Palm Sunday. We've got to use these for something, right? On the count of three, I want you to wave your palms and shout Hosanna, all right? So on the count of three, Hosanna, and you know, wave your palm, okay? One, two, three. Hosanna! Yeah, well, thank you for going that far with me. <laughs> And it was perhaps a little more enthusiastic than I expected, but we were holding back, weren't we? But if I could just magically transport 200 people, you know, we were all crushed in this room together, and these other 200 people, they're all wildly waving the, their branches and, and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Pretty soon, some of us, many of us, maybe all of us, we'd get all wrapped up in that, right? And we'd just kind of go along with them. We'd be shouting too, and we'd be all happy, because that's what happens. You get riled up by the people shouting things. And so those cheering Jesus on, they're riling up all the other people they come in contact with as they approach the city. So the crowd of people cheering on Jesus becomes what Matthew describes as a very large crowd. And not just a small group of people, not just an isolated pocket of people, but a, a huge number. The King James Version actually translates it as a very great multitude. Not just a great multitude, but a very great multitude. Like a sea of people, right? They're all shouting praises to Jesus. Hosanna, save us. And so this becomes one of the, one of the few places we see in Scripture where Jesus, while he is on this earth, is actually recognized for the glory that he deserves. It must have been something to be there that day. Jesus receiving the glory of the people. Jesus receiving the favor. But glory, as we said, is fleeting. Crowds can turn in an instant as Jesus experienced. Flash forward five days. Friday morning. 
The religious leaders have conspired, had conspired for the previous evening, Jesus to be arrested in secret. And throughout the night, they had conducted a series of trials that were illegal according to God's word. And they had found and declared Jesus guilty of blasphemy and deserving of death. But under Roman rule, they can't kill anyone for this charge. They don't have the authority under the Romans. So you know what they have to do? They have to go to the Romans to get the death sentence. And so early Friday morning, they bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in Jerusalem at the time, and they're seeking the death penalty. And in his gospel, Matthew tells us, hey, Pontius Pilate knows Jesus has committed no crime. Pilate knows it's only out of jealousy that the religious leaders have handed Jesus over to him. So to try to set Jesus free, and really himself free, from this trap that had been set by the religious leaders, Pilate tries to, to, to get Jesus off. He, he tries to use an old Passover tradition. It was Pilate's tradition at the Passover to release one Jewish prisoner that had been taken captive by the Romans. So in trying to set Jesus free, Pilate comes to the crowd and he gives him a choice. I'm going to set someone free. I've got Jesus set free, or should I set free this Barabbas guy who, who's guilty of leading a rebellion against Rome? And seemingly to Pilate's surprise, when he asks which of these two men he should let go, the people answer, Barabbas. And faced with this seemingly irrational response, Pilate asks the crowd what he should do with Jesus. And when he asks him, he reminds him, hey, he's Jesus, he's called Messiah. It's like, it's like Pilate is, is pointing out to him, hey, this is the guy five days ago you were wanting to make your king. What should I do with him? And this appalling answer comes back, crucify him. And Matthew says, they all answered. Meaning, not just some, but everyone in the crowd said, crucify him. And when Pilate argues back with them, the whole crowd begins shouting. They shout, crucify him. His blood is on us and our children. Translation, hey, we're going to take responsibility for his death. The crowd is hungry for it. They are shouting for it now. And so the glory of Jesus that had been recognized by the crowd earlier in the week, it's fleeting. The crowd has turned, and now they're after blood. Right? They want it. They want it so badly, they're on the brink of riot. And that's ultimately why Pilate gives in. To stave off a riot, he hands Jesus over to be killed. He hands him over to be crucified. Now, how did it happen? What caused this crowd to shout, crucify him? And I tell you today, I think it's the same thing that caused the multitudes to shout, Hosanna, earlier in the week. They were riled up by a smaller group of people. In fact, Sandy, show us. Matthew writes this. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. The chief priests and the elders, they work the crowd up. They shout for crucifixion. They encourage other people to shout for crucifixion. And suddenly just everybody else is following what's going on. And they're all shouting, crucify him. The crowd has turned. The glory extended to Jesus earlier in the week is revoked because Jesus is the victim of what we call mob mentality. And you know what mob mentality is. It's when you're in a group of people and just an attitude of a small group of people spreads to somebody else and the whole mob goes after it, right? You know, I was talking to my brother-in-law Pete earlier in the week about this and he said it reminds him of rioting and, and looters at a riot because you know how riots start like a, a, a small group of people are upset about something and they start making a fuss and they start getting maybe a little bit violent but, but that, that, that attitude just spreads to other people and other people start getting involved until you've got a whole large group of people rioting and you know this, right? You, you know when you see rioting being reported on the news you know what's coming if not right away, at least in another couple hours, newsreel of people breaking through storefronts and stealing TVs or high chairs or something. I, I, I don't know. But people who normally wouldn't steal a thing, they just start stealing things. They just go with the crowd, right? Now everybody else is doing it, so they go and do it. And they're going to steal TVs too. They go with the crowd. And that's why the people are here shouting, crucify him. They're just going with the crowd. The same way all the people went with the crowd on Palm Sunday. 
It's just mob mentality. No one there is really thinking about what they're doing. No one's sincere deeply or very few are sincere in their actions or what they're doing. They're just going along with it. And the result of people going along with the crowd is Jesus, an innocent man, being sentenced to death. I suppose it's human nature to go along with the crowd, right? But here we see when that happens, when, when people just go along with the crowd, there are real consequences. There are heartbreaking consequences that happen every time. And we look at these scenes from Scripture, and we're confused by them, and we wonder, what is wrong with these people? Right? How could they be so easily swayed to shout praises to Jesus one day, and five days later they're so easily swayed to shout for a gruesome, horrible, torturous death sentence? Right? What's wrong with these people? And we think this way until we recognize, oh, too often we're the same way. When it comes to living out our faith or our commitment to our relationship with Jesus Christ, too often we just go with the crowd. We get riled up and enticed into adopting whatever activity or attitude or opinion everybody else around us is caught up in. And so we just go along with it too, right? I mean, for instance, we, we come to church Sunday, right? And here we are, right? And, and at church, everyone just likes Jesus. Everyone's excited about God, and we like God and stuff, right? So we come to church, and, and, and we're excited about Jesus, and we like God and stuff, and, and we're pure, and we're chaste here, and we're calm, and we're loving, and we're forgiving. And we'll gladly declare in unison and in song how great is our God and how much we love our Lord Jesus Christ, right? We go with it. We love it. But then we get to Monday and we're with, you know, co-workers or we get to school or we get with our friends or whatever. <clears throat> we're with a crowd or around us. So they're not so hyped up about Jesus, right? And they're excited about some things, but they're excited about other things, things God says, well, maybe that's not the best thing. Sometimes it's things God says, that's not even a good thing. But they're excited about it. And they're excited about it around us. And everybody else is excited about it. So what do we do? Let's be honest. Too often we just go with the crowd and we're swayed by that, right? All the happy Jesus stuff, it just goes away. Go with the crowd. For instance, you go to work or with your, you're with your friends and the conversation becomes a little off color. It becomes a little bit crude or ungodly. What do we do? You can get up and walk away. You can put your hand down and say, this is done right now and I'm redirecting this conversation. But what do we do? Too often we, we just go with the crowd, right? At best, we, we just remain silent. Or maybe worse, we, uh, we actually join in. Right? Go with the crowd. Crucify them. Or how about this? You come into a little extra money. Does this ever actually happen to anyone? Does anybody ever actually come into a little bit of extra money? I don't know. But you come into a little bit of extra money. Maybe it's a bonus at work or a gift or, hey, it's the right time of season. Income tax return, right? You get a little extra money. And you know there are real needs in the world that you could contribute at least some of this money toward them, right? Or you got the work of your local church. you got world missions. We have hungry people in our own communities. But everyone around you who's got a little bit of extra money... They're just spending it on more toys for themselves, right? They'll go on a lavish vacation or, or some home remodeling or get a bigger or nicer or fancier car or, or maybe some expensive clothes or some jewelry. They're just going out and doing it. So what do you do? Do you do what everyone else is doing and ignore the needs of the world and spend it on what makes me happy? After all, you've earned it, right? It's yours, Everybody else is doing it. Just go with the crowd. Crucify him. Or how about this one? You're at the football game. Some of you go and visit your kids or your grandkids at the football games. And, and normally, you're with people who wouldn't say a bad thing about anyone. Right? But you get to the football game, and it's not going well for your team. And everyone else around you starts criticizing the coach, shouting at the players on the other team, cursing out the refs, and everyone's doing it. What do you do? You maintain that attitude of love that God wants you to have? 
or do you just go with the crowd? It must be all right if everybody else is doing it, right? So just, just here, I'll just go with the crowd, and I'll curse some people out and shout at some people and be not nice. Crucify him. Right? As followers of Jesus, we are called out of society. We are called out of the world, separated by God to live holy, righteous lives for the glory of Jesus Christ. Every day, we encounter different crowds, people, or groups of people who don't live for Jesus. They live for their own ends. They live for their own purposes. And every day, those crowds, just by being around us, try to persuade us to do the same, to live in ways that don't honor Jesus. The same way the religious leaders in Jesus' day persuaded the crowd to have him crucified. And every day, we must decide whether we are going to live for Jesus or whether we're just going to go with the crowd in what we're doing every day. See, it's not easy to go against the crowd. It's not easy to follow after Jesus when so many around us are not. But I tell you one person, one voice standing up to the crowd for Jesus can make all the difference. Let me tell you about something I experienced just this Thursday. I was with our youth on Thursday night, and you know most of our youth, about 90% of them at least, are not churched people. They, 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 they don't go to church. They're not being raised by, 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 by people who are in church. They don't know a whole lot about Christian stuff. And, um, well, we were talking, I was teaching them, about, teaching them about evolution and how the theory of evolution just really goes against so much of what we're taught in Scripture, but also it's just bad science. It's just not good science, ladies and gentlemen. And I was teaching them this, and, and there were about ten of them there on Thursday, but they've so often been told in so many places in our society that the theory of evolution is so accurate and it is so factual that they wouldn't even really consider what I was trying to tell them. They wouldn't consider the other point of view. I mean, they were listening politely and we were talking back and forth, but they were very much opposed to anything I was saying. Except there was one teen who was there, who uh, does go to church on a regular basis and does have a commitment to Jesus Christ. And he did understand my point of view and kind of shared it. Now, he could have just stood there and kept his mouth shut and not looked foolish in front of his nine other friends. He could have just gone with the crowd. But instead, he spoke up very intelligently, I might add, about his faith and how he found the theory of evolution to be lacking. And because he followed Jesus instead of the crowd, the whole situation changed. Instead of it being me having an argument with a group of, uh, of closed-minded teenagers, we were actually having a conversation now and considering one another's points of view. Now, now did we fully uh, convince anyone to change their mind completely? I, I don't know, but that's not the point. The point was the situation changed. One voice not going with the crowd changed the course of the whole evening. If there had been just one voice that day before Pontius Pilate who hadn't gone with the crowd, what would have happened? Maybe an innocent man would not have been sentenced to death. Because one voice that doesn't go with the crowd but instead stands up for God can change things. There are crowds of people living out there, many of them living for anything but the kingdom of God. Some of them mean intentional harm for the cause of Christ in our world. Some of them, they're just out there living and they're just clueless. Either way, the result's the same. Today I want to encourage you not to be swayed by those crowds, but to live for Jesus in every situation and in all situations. One voice can make a difference and bring glory to God when the rest of the crowd is just dead set against it. Today I challenge you to let that voice be yours.